Ich bin hier im Bayerischen Hof und ich freue mich wahnsinnig, dass ich einen unserer Top-Gäste vom Filmfest München 2019 hier bei mir sitzen habe. Das ist nämlich Mats Brügger und Mats Brügger ist dieses Jahr zum zweiten Mal in München und dieses Mal gleich mit einer Retrospektive und er hat einen, ich möchte sagen, Biest von einem Film mitgebracht, nämlich Cold Case Hammershirt und über den wollen wir natürlich sprechen. But first of all, a huge and warm welcome to Munich. Welcome back. Guten Tag and thank you very much. What did you say? Da, äh, ich versuche Deutsch zu sprechen, aber meine Deutsche ist nicht so gut. So we could actually do that in German and I don't have to prepare everything in English. When I was a teenager I went to a German language course at the Bodensee mm -hmm. uh, with the Humboldt Institute. So I do have some some of, of, of that is still dormant in me, but, but I am not very functional speaking German. And my Danish sucks too, so we try English. Yes. So, um, how did you feel when, when we told you that there will be the big homage to your, to your work and we will show four of your films? Um, did you feel honored? V very much so. Um, and but also, I'm, I'm very happy about being back in Munich. I really enjoyed the city. I like the uh, festival a lot. Um, and um, being, you know, it's, it's a bit weird having a retrospective done whilst you are still, you know, a active as a filmmaker. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm enjoying it. So four of your films will be screened. Um, for, for people who haven't seen any of your films yet, would you recommend a certain order? Like the, in the order that you made them? Or could I start? with Hammershirt? Actually, I think any order would work. So uh, I, I recommend the uh, random approach. <laughs> shuffle. Shuffle, yes. Keep it on shuffle. Okay, I've collected many, many uh, compliments and descriptions about you and um, people call you um, the agent provocateur and then they compare you to Borat and say you're the intellectual European version of it and then uh, people talk about Michael Moore and then they talk about this fascinating mixture of fiction and documentary. Um, which description do you like about your work? I don't know really. Um Actually, uh, Borat or Sasha Baron Cohen is a, a trained historian. He studied at Oxford, so he, he is actually very smart. Regarding Michael Moore, him I consider a uh, he's an activist, which I am not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my point of reference and what I based by films on is actually uh, journalism. Mm -hmm. And um, where my films tend to, to deviate from c conventional documentaries um, is because me striving to make my films as unique as possible, because I think it's, it's a problem that many documentaries are very similar. Um, so if you are, you know, lucky and, 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 and have a, you, you manage to have a film fully funded, I think it's your obligation to make it as, uh, as special as possible. You started with journalism and I, if I'm well informed, your parents were both journalists too. Um, so when was the decision made and why to, to do films, to make films? It kind of happened by, you know, um, I was working at Danish Broadcasting Corporation and uh, I did uh, the Red Chapel about uh, a, a cultural exchange project in North Korea involving two Danish Korean comedians, one of whom is a self-proclaimed spastic. And that was uh, initially aired in Denmark uh, as a, as a four-part series being broadcasted on Friday evenings in December. Now in December in, in Denmark, uh, and especially on Fridays, people are out having 
Christmas lunches getting insanely drunk. And the ones who are not at Christmas lunches, who are back at home watching television, are very boring and also very passive, aggressive people. Um, and they were sitting there watching the Red Chapel as a series, which made them enormously angry. So there, there was a lot of complaints about it to Danish broadcasting. Um, I think also because many Danish people have a very romanticized idea about, you know, the noble Asians, uh, Asians being more sophisticated than, you know, brutish, primitive Danish people. Mm -hmm. And uh, their, their feeling were that we were kind of exploiting Asian hospitality and also making a mockery of Asian mentality. Um, so it was considered a, a, a huge failure, the Red Chapel. Uh, but then, luckily, the person who was producing it within Danish Broadcasting, he left for Centruba, the production company of Lars von Trier. And him and I discussed, you know, having the material taken out of Danish Broadcasting and then editing it into a, a feature-length film. Uh, and... Um, and after a lot of difficulties, uh, we, we managed to do so. And, uh, and that was what really um, made my career as a filmmaker take off. But you still work um, uh, for radio. And how important is that for you to keep, um, to keep a stable day job, maybe? I don't know, maybe that sounds too, too low. But um, to separate that, that you can do art, you do documentaries, you do film, and you have another job. How, is that important for you? Uh, very important, because it means that I am not financially dependent on making films. And it's nice because the projects I involve myself in are high-risk pro projects, very fragile projects, which can easily collapse. Um, so it will not mean you know, the end of me financially if one of my films, you know, for one reason or another, collapses. Um, another thing is nice, which is nice, is w when you go to film festivals and meet other filmmakers and learn about how much they strive to make ends meet. I, I'm very happy about you know having a daytime job yeah. because paradoxically, even though we are living in the golden age of documentaries. And, um, and there is a lot of money in the industry. The filmmakers themselves, actually, they do not make a, a lot of money on it. Very little, actually. When we talk about now your, your latest film that you bring to Munich, um, you've worked very long on that film. I think seven years or even more. Um, maybe let's just start with how you how the whole thing started. I mean, how did you, how did you find Göran? How did you find the story? How did it all begin? Well, it, it began in uh, around 2011, where I read an article about the private Swedish researcher, Göran Björkdahl, mm -hmm. and how he was busy tracking down the remaining black witnesses um, who saw or witnessed Da Kammerschul's plane crashing at Endola uh, in September 1961. And I thought initially this is very interesting. So I invited Jörn to, uh, to Copenhagen, to Denmark, for a meeting also to get my bearings on if he was like a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist. Uh, but um, in fact, he is the very opposite. He's a very clear-minded, very skeptically thinking um, uh, person. And then he also told me the story about the missile plate that his father was given at the crash site with these little holes in it. And um, the, the combination of, of his you know, research with the witnesses, but also the missile plate, made me think there must be a film in this. In, you know, for starters, I thought a fairly simple film, 
but then uh, it evolved into a, a never-ending investigation. Is that, I mean, I imagine on the one hand, it's one of the greatest things that can happen to you as a documentary filmmaker, that something like that happens. Mm. Like, you find out so many, like, crazy and heartbreaking things that you did. I'm not going to spoil that. I mean, uh, we want people, of course, to watch it. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, it must have been devastating, and especially for you who, who uses a lot of comedy and, and comic relief in his films. Um, how did you experience that? I mean, on the one hand, it's great. You find out a great story. And then on the other hand, you feel like that's probably too tough now. Or I can, I don't know. How did you feel? Well, there, there were moments of, uh, of despair and, and desperation. Um, at one point, I was also contemplating, you know, walking away from the film. Uh, in the end, not doing so because, by by nature, I am a a Protestant. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is important for me, you know, finishing off. Mm -hmm. And also because I thought that, you know, I I simply did not want to let you on down. Yeah. Um, but that. You know, we were working on a lot of leads, which, you know, in the end turned out to be, you know, a, a, a goose chase. Yeah. Um, there was a, we were working on a Russian lead, uh, a Romanian lead. <laughs> um, there was a rumor within the Dark Hammarskjöld murder mystery research community that a group of Romanian assassins Uh, posing as an economical delegation from Bucharest, mm -hmm. came to uh, the Congo, and uh, they were the ones freelancing for the KGB. They were the ones who planted a bomb inside Hammarskjöld's plane. And while being there, they were hiding in a Belgian chocolaterie, which is a nice detail, yes. you know? Yes. Uh, so we hired a Romanian journalist to go through the archives of the Romanian Foreign Service. Um, which was a very time-consuming and also expensive mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, it, it was, you know, a goose chase. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had several, you know, sites, you know, uh, parallel investigations, which turned out to be, you know, not worth our efforts or money and time. And, um, so it was like sitting on top of a mountain of research, which was just, you know, piling up. Yeah. Um, but all, all along, Jørgen and, and I had a, a, you know, an instinct-based feeling that in the heart of this was something very dark and sinister. Yeah. Um, A very decisive turning point was actually meeting uh, General Grunewald, mm -hmm. uh, who was head of military intelligence in South Africa during apartheid. And um, him telling us that Maxwell, the, the villain of the film, um, or the last known leader of a strange underground militia, that, uh, that he was financed and controlled by British intelligence. Mm. It's a very extraordinary piece of information. Uh, and also the mere fact that Grunewald met with Maxwell uh, twice mm. is also extraordinary because at that point in time I thought of Maxwell as a, as a sort of, you know, buffoonish, clownish character. But that, you know, totally changed my understanding of who Maxwell was. Uh, but then at the same time, Grunewald saying that he had never really heard about this underground militia mm -hmm. is also very weird. Mm -hmm. So that, that meant a lot, meeting him. And, um, but, but while piecing the film together, I, I thought a lot about how if there could be comic relief in the film, uh, if, if comedy was allowed in the film at all, because it evolves into a, a horror film. Um, but I am a firm believer in the importance of 
comedy, also as a way of uh, enhancing and emphasizing tragedy, actually. Mm. When did you decide to, to put yourself in front of the camera in that film again? Was it, was it there from the very beginning? No, no it, it wasn't in, in, from... At, at the beginning, my idea was a film which would document the work of Johan Bjørkdal. And... Um, um, but gradually I discovered that it, it, it was, you know, necessary for me to interfere also because Jørgen's, you know, he has a lot of qualities, but when he, for example, when he does interviews, he asks, he asks questions which, you know, you know, do, are not needed to be covered. You know, questions which would make the interviews last maybe three hours. Um, so, and, but also, you know, in order to uh, captivate and portray Jørgen as a character, um, he, you know, I realized that he would need some sort of sidekick. And finally, and most importantly, it fairly quickly dawned on me that if there was to be made any sort of meaningful narrative out of this, there would have to be narration in the film. Um, which, um, you know, meant that, that I was, you know, to narrate the film. Is that also a question of, of vanity as, a, as an artist, as a filmmaker, to put yourself in the film? Um, I wonder. N no, uh, be because, you know, there's, there's a saying in, in, in Danish that if you stick, stick out your bum, you will have your temperature taken. <laughs> you know, well, you know, I, I, I do have narcissistic tendencies. Um, but it, it is not mainly because I, you know, I am looking for, you know, um, that I want to expose myself, that, that I am, am in my films. It is uh, also by necessity. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I mean, when you talk about becoming visible and, and I mean, you go, I mean, you do go really far with your films and, and with The Ambassador, for example, when, when a, a person you were working with gets killed. And I mean, you put yourself in danger in, with the films that you do. You put uh, the people you work with mm -hmm. in danger. Um, so where does that, I don't know, is that courage, I guess, or recklessness at a certain point because you feel like you want to tell the story? I mean, how, how do you... How do you do that? I mean, or are you just not afraid at all? And just afterwards? Well, you know, if, if, I, if I was merely a, you know, a, a danger tourist or a thrill seeker, there were better ways of, you know, getting myself killed than going to the Central African Republic or uh, North Korea. Um, I, I am actually very concerned about, you know, the fallout of my films, and also if it will affect people who are in my films. And uh, I, I constantly strive to, you know, uh, you know, to get a feeling of the morals and ethics of what I am in involving myself in. Mm -hmm. um, What, what is still a dilemma for me is um, filming in North Korea. Because no matter what you do there, uh, e e you know, e either, uh, you know, be it conventional journalism, uh, filmmaking, uh, you know, more 
you know, hybrid projects and so on. If you, at the end of the day, publish or release something which contains just the slightest bit of criticism about the regime, in theory, they could choose to punish the North Koreans who were assigned to, uh, you know, uh, to observe and control and, and, and monitor what you're doing. And um, of course, a film is not worth anybody getting killed. That, that goes without saying. So the question is, if, if that is true, should you then refrain from going to North Korea at all? Uh, and, and there are no easy answers there. Um, luckily, recently, I, I learned about that the, the main character of the Red Chapel, the main North Korean character, Mrs. Park, that, um, that she is uh, still, uh, still alive and uh, doing fine, which means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what draws you to, I mean, to these stories and, and countries that, um, well, at least on a, you know, at a first glimpse are so far away from, from you know, your world and the stories that you could actually achieve so much easier. So North Korea and um, China and uh, Africa, many African countries, you, you shoot your films in. What, I don't know, what, what inspires you? I mean, how does that happen? Like, will there be a nice Mats Brugger film in Denmark it, next year? It, it, it eventually, maybe yes, but that is not something I, I, uh, I am planning for. I think some of it has to do with my Danishness and, you know, living in Denmark, which is probably the most comfortable and secure place on the, this planet, I, I suppose. Um, and because of that, I, I am drawn towards countries which are either, you know, failed states, dictatorships, um, where there is no reality principle. Um, and there's a Danish writer named Henrik Stangerup who wrote about that in, in Denmark, you know, we do have torture, he wrote. But the difference being is that in Denmark, they remove one millimeter of your penis every year. Uh, so, you know, in, in, in that metaphor, I am, I am pitching for countries where they, you know, remove everything at once. Yeah. Yes. I get it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, what, I, what I was thinking about um, being a journalist myself, and of course you're a journalist, and um, the, the age we're living in right now with uh, fake news and wrong information and, you know, um, conspiracy theories everywhere, and someone who who makes films that are somewhere, you know, like a hybrid between fiction and documentary. Um, it's funny how your films feel more transparent to me than, a, you know, a strict documentary. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I wonder why that works. I wonder why your films seem so clear to me, mm -hmm. although you use so much fictionalized stuff. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can explain it to me. Well, that is, that is, I would say, the main reason for being, you know, visible mm -hmm. and present as a narrator, as a, as a character in my own films, is that I, you know, I, I really strive to make my films as, um, and I know that sounds absurd coming from me probably, but, but as honest as possible, uh, you know, as much as possible declaring what I am doing, how I am doing it, um, and, um, and not taking any prisoners, you know, um, thereby also, you know, putting my own, um, you know, n name on the line. Um, the, the opposite of what goes on in my films is, you know, the ideal about being the proverbial fly on the wall. Mm -hmm. um, and 
in fact, you know, and, and, and the proverbial fly on the wall is what a lot of people consider to be real documentary making. Um, but in fact, these films can easily be much more manipulative uh, and uh, tr trickery uh, than uh, what I'm doing. But it's, it's, it, the problem is it's, it's not very, you know, it's difficult for people to, to you know, identify what's going on in these films. Yeah, because you don't see um, the clear motivation and the clear, you know, narrator. Um, does it bother you if people find you cynical? I mean, because I truly believe that you're a very, very, um, like a very ethical filmmaker and I, I feel a lot of integrity in what you do and um, with a sense of humor, which is maybe sometimes crass, I don't know. But w would that bother you if people find you cynical, if they don't get the jokes, if they, if they find it cynical to go to these countries and pose as a, you know, like the ambassador or whatever, there are, there are scenes in there that are totally cringeworthy and mm -hmm. would that bother you? Or is that part of, you know, the films that you make, some, someone might find it distasteful? N n not, not really, um, you know, there are cynicism in my films and also in me. Um, if you work in journalism for more than 10 years, you will become a cynic, you know. Um, and furthermore, I, I enjoy negative attention. I, yeah, I do, I, do, I do enjoy people being, being angry at me. Not, you know, if, not if everyone is angry at me. That, that, that could be kind of a, a, a downer. But I, I do enjoy, you know, some people being angry at me. Do you, do you attract uh, the, the anger from the people that you actually want to annoy? Ideally, yes. And, um, but I, I also misfire from time to time. Um, what was interesting, you know, with the ambassador, mm -hmm. I was, when I was uh, touring festivals with the ambassador, all the Q&As was about morals, ethics, uh, and my morals and ethics and, and lack thereof, which was really, you know, grinding me down. Um, but then I came to Moscow Film Festival, and um, after the screening we had a Q&A, and I realized that they perceived the film as a very positive story about a young businessman who, who wants to make some money, and that's, you know, really great. <laughs> so all the questions were in the line of, uh, I also want to invest in diamonds. Uh, can I have some uh, phone numbers for Monsieur Gilbert? And, mm -hmm. and uh, so they had a totally different uh, t take on it, which I kind of enjoyed. Has that happened with the, with the latest film too? Do some people find anything? No, I hope not. Well, um, Danes and Swedes have a kind of, um, a, a, there's a lot of ambivalence in our relationship. Mm -hmm. or, you know, we are a part of the Sc Scandinavian, uh, you know, community, brotherhood and sisterhood. Mm -hmm. But in, in the past, we fought a lot of wars with each other. And uh, we, we do have issues with each other, good and bad. Um, I think you know many Danish people dream about being popular in Sweden. I, I, I do for sure. And I thought that Cold Case Summerschuld would be my ticket to yeah. Swedish popularity. And? They they really you know they didn't enjoy that film as as much as as I had hoped. I think maybe because he is still Hammarskjöld is still revered as revered as a national icon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably also because of me mixing, you know, comedy into Dark Hammerschuld. But um, one of one of the reviews 
I think the headline was uh, something in the line of uh, what a giant narcissist he is. Something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well. Mm, I, watched, I watched the film this morning with an official link I was given. And um, I had to stop it several times and because I wanted to research some stuff and I wasn't that familiar with the story. No, no. And so I had to check stuff and... and very, you know, I was shocked at a at a certain point in the film. How do you want people to, you know, in your ideal director um, view, how should people react when they go to the to the theaters and they cannot stop like I could and research mm-hmm. stuff? So, what is your ideal reception? Well, my, you know, my g- gameplay for the film. And, and that do sound cynical, I suppose. But my idea about how the film should play out was uh, f- first part of the film being for people who are familiar with my previous films, um, a case of, you know, here we go again. Uh, you know, me and Jörn Björkdal uh, goofing around, in, in investigating, but not really it's not really leading anywhere. And from that point onwards, when we realize that, you know, we have not found the smoking gun, the film um, changes character and becomes uh, a very strict mathematical uh, and highly disturbing horror film, which it, it totally pulls you out of, uh, of whatever comfort zone you have been been in before and um, and 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 that will you know that that will have an uh, an effect on you um, and but how you know what what your feelings or, or state of mind should be after leaving the cinema that is difficult for me to uh, to say. Can you tell us a bit about? Is there anything? Is there already a new project you you have in mind? Have you started researching anything after after this one, or are you enjoying? After seven years, now it's finished. I am I'm waiting. No, I'm um, parallel to doing the Dark Hammerschuld film. I began developing another project which is, we are almost done shooting it now, and uh, have begun uh, editing. It, it's a v- very, very uh, s- a secret project, so I, I, I can't tell you about it. But it would be a, a really good film. W- what is new regarding Cold Case Hammerschild is that uh, recently we facilitated a meeting between Alexander Jones, our main witness. Mm-hmm. He was an officer in this um, secretive underground militia and uh, between him and investigators from the United Nations so they met and, and his affidavit will be part of their uh, investigation and report which will be published in July uh, as far as I know it is leaning heavily towards a conspiracy to kill Dark Hammarskjöld okay. we have also been providing the UN with uh, our research materials and uh, after he left South Africa, Alexander Jones has been even more forthcoming with us about what he know and, and what he took part in. And um, so far, what we have been able to corroborate from what he tells us, that, that checks out. The, the main question, of course, is what was the size and scope of this alleged vaccination program. Did it actually happen? Uh, in the film, we have two, two persons who have, they had the experience of taking part in a sinister vaccination program with you know, the purpose to kill as many black people as possible. Um, but a lot of questions still need to be answered. Uh, how was it financed? The scientific side to it must have been extremely advanced. 
Um, but a private foundation will now um, cover and fund a in-depth investigation of that, which is very important, I think. Is that, I mean, I imagine this must be one of the most satisfying um, things that can happen to you as a journalist and as a documentary filmmaker, that you actually discover something, that you actually, you know, a cold case gets reopened and then further investigations and about the vaccination program and stuff. So that must, be, I guess, must make you really proud. Well, of, 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 of course, yes, but, you know, um, I, I, you know, I have my, 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 my hopes and and it's a, a bit too early, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of uh, jinxing it. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. uh, I, I want to wait and see if, you know, the investigation will be carried through. And I'm also, you know, waiting for the UN report mm -hmm. before I will uh, uncork a bottle of uh, champagne. Yeah. yeah. Would you like to have carried on with the film? Yes. Yeah, yeah it's it's... In the end, it became like um, a very expensive hobby. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's difficult letting go. You are one of our guests of honor, and you will have your um, A Beautiful Filmmaker's Life with uh, Sophia, our programmer, and your films are being screened. But do you have any other plans while you're here in Munich? No, just uh, in enjoying myself as, uh, as, you know, that sounds strange. No, 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 but enjoying the, uh, the uh, city um, as uh, much as possible. Um, I'm here with my family. I have two boys, they want to go to the park where you can uh, s go surfing. Yeah, so in the English garden. Yes, that is on the uh, agenda. Okay. And... Um, I, I want to see some films also. Good idea. Yes. And you you were here last year with uh, the St. Bernard Syndicate, I think it was last year. Yeah. And um, do you have any fond memories of the festival, if you'd have to? The uh, Biergarten Breakfast yes. was a, a very nice experience. <laughs> uh, Bavarian brunch. Mm -hmm. And um, meeting a lot of very nice people fun people. Also, I, I went and sh I saw um, the um, uh, the movie Donpass, yeah. which was a masterpiece. So, um, I highly recommend this uh, festival. It's really fun. I highly recommend uh, Mats Brüggers films. Um, Kommt vorbei, kommt aufs Filmfest München 2019. Unter anderem, weil wir eine Retrospektive zu diesem äh, hervorragenden dänischen Filmemacher haben. Thank you very much.